Welcome to Barstow in San Bernardino County, Southern California. Here you can explore the expansive freight yard before you head out, following the famous Route 66 through the Mojave Desert into San Bernardino. There's a missing safety sign over there. Let's go fix it while you're here. There are many more tasks to discover on this route. Along the way, make sure to put up route maps, install safety signs, refill water caches, and visit the food trucks. Today, we'll be riding along in this ES-44 C4. Climb aboard and take a seat. To date, BNSF have rostered over 300 ES-44 C4 units. The ES in the name of this model denotes that it's part of GE's Evolution series, and the 44, its rated horsepower of 4,400. C denotes that it has three axles per truck, and the 4, its four traction motors. Barstow Yard contains 48 directional tracks. It covers a total area of 593 acres. That's uh, 240 hectares. It is the second largest marshalling yard west of the Rocky Mountains. Although this yard has been in operation since the 19th century, much of what you see today was constructed in the early 1970s at a cost of over 50 million dollars. Today, around 1,000 staff are employed here to route freight to and from the Mojave, Needles, and Cajon subdivisions. Each year, over 150,000 locomotives stop at or pass through Barstow Yard. And each day, over 175,000 tons of freight is moved through San Bernardino County. On this route, you will learn to operate ES-44 C4 as you tackle stunning mountain ranges through the winding curves of California. And serve local industry as you switch and cut formations in the SD-40-2. You pick the pace. This is Train Sim World Cajon Pass. In this training module, you'll be learning how to drive this ES-44 C4 locomotive in BNSF railway livery. The ES-44 C4 is the fourth generation of the GE Evolution series. It started production in 2009 and continued to be built until 2015. Rated at 4,400 horsepower, 
These beasts are primarily used for heavy freight and intermodal traffic. When you're ready to begin, climb aboard. Uh, sit in the engineer's seat. Now you'll go through the steps needed to take over this locomotive. Firstly, you will need to set the generator field switch. This needs to be enabled for the throttle to control the power of the train. This locomotive requires the reverser handle to be inserted before operation. Uh, the reverser determines the direction of travel. Now switch the front headlights on. Regardless of the time of day or weather, all locomotives must have their headlights on. When getting moving, it's worth remembering the following sequence. Independent on, auto off, throttle on, independent off. Let's go through that slowly and understand why. First, fully apply the independent brake. Now, this will ensure that regardless of anything else, your train won't move. Next, Fully release the automatic brake. This will release the brakes on the rest of the train, but you won't go anywhere because those independent brakes are holding you. Now apply a small amount of throttle and verify that power is generated. Finally, release the independent brake and you'll start moving. This is a great practice to get used to, because it'll help you with two key areas. The first is that you verify that the train will take power before you release the brakes. You don't want to find yourself without power and having to hurriedly put the brakes back on. Uh, the second is that having power applied as you release the independent brakes ensures that you won't roll backwards. On steeper hill starts, you may even need to start with more power, and this is something you can practice and get used to as you find yourself out on the railroad. If you have any locomotives on the rear of the train behind freight cars, you can press the banking comms button to enable radio communications with those remote units. This will ensure that they operate their throttle and brakes in unison with your own locomotive giving you much-needed extra control on your journey. Uh, press it now, just to get practice, even though there aren't any connected. Coasting is a method used to efficiently maintain speed and reduce motor stress and maintenance requirements. Come to a stop in the indicated position using the independent brake. Independent brakes apply only to the locomotives in the formation and are much faster to apply and release than the automatic brake, which operates on the entire train.
Change direction with a reverser. Then change the junction indicated, either by walking over to it or using the map. Before proceeding, check the two couplers are in the right position to allow for automatic coupling. Look at the rear coupler on your train and ensure it's open. Operate the cut bar if it is closed to release it. Next, walk over to the freight cars you're going to couple to and check their coupler knuckle is open too. Operate the cut bar here to open the knuckle. Before coupling cars, always check the knuckles are open, or you'll just bounce right off. Okay. The junction is correctly aligned and the cars are ready to couple. I couple up to the cars by gently driving into them at a slow speed. And most freight uses automatic knuckle couplers, so they will automatically couple once they connect. speed is too high, you risk derailing when coupling. Apply some brakes to slow your approach. Hey, nice work! Now change direction with the reverser and move the train forward into the indicated siding. Remember to apply a little power before releasing brakes. While it's not strictly necessary in the training center, this is the time to start forming great habits. Since you have freight cars coupled, you should slow down using the automatic brake and get the extra braking effort from those freight cars. The automatic brake applies brakes throughout the entire train.
uncouple the cars either by using the external camera or by walking to the cars on foot. That's it for this training module. Welcome to driver training at the training center. Today you'll be learning how to drive this EMD SD40-2 locomotive in BNSF railway livery. The SD40-2 started production in 1972 with the last unit being built in 1986. Rated at 3,000 horsepower and weighing at least 170 tons, the SD40-2 is rated with a continuous tractive effort of 831,000 pounds. Over 4,000 SD40-2 locomotives were produced by EMD in various configurations, and many are still in use today. 50 years after they were first introduced. When you're ready to begin, climb aboard. Uh, sit in the engineer's seat. Now you'll go through the steps needed to take over this locomotive. Firstly, you will need to set the generator field switch. This needs to be enabled for the throttle to control the power of the train. This locomotive requires the reverser handle to be inserted before operation. Uh, the reverser determines the direction of travel. Now switch the front headlights on. Regardless of the time of day or weather, all locomotives must have their headlights on. When getting moving, it's worth remembering the following sequence. Independent on, auto off, throttle on, independent off. Let's go through that slowly and understand why. First, fully apply the independent brake. Now, this will ensure that regardless of anything else, your train won't move. Next, fully release the automatic brake. This will release the brakes on the rest of the train, but you won't go anywhere because those independent brakes are holding you. Now, apply a small amount of throttle and verify that power is generated. Finally, release the independent brake and you'll start moving. This is a great practice to get used to because it'll help you with two key areas. The first is that you verify that the train will take power before you release the brakes. You don't want to find yourself without power and having to hurriedly put the brakes back on. Uh, the second is that having power applied as you release the independent brakes ensures that you won't roll backwards. On steeper hill starts, you may even need to start with more power. And this is something you can practice and get used to as you find yourself out on the railroad. If you have any locomotives on the rear of the train behind freight cars, you can press the banking comms button to enable radio communications with those remote units. This will ensure that they operate their throttle and brakes in unison with your own locomotive, giving you much needed extra control on your journey. Now press it now, just to get practice, even though there aren't any connected. Coasting is a method used to efficiently maintain speed and reduce motor stress and maintenance requirements. Come to a stop in the indicated position using the independent brake. 
Independent brakes apply only to the locomotives in the formation and are much faster to apply and release than the automatic brake, which operates on the entire train. Change direction with a reverser, then change the junction indicated, either by walking over to it or using the map. Before proceeding, check the two couplers are in the right position to allow for automatic coupling. Look at the rear coupler on your train and ensure it's open. Operate the cut bar if it is closed to release it. Next, walk over to the freight cars you're going to couple to and check their coupler knuckle is open too. Operate the cut bar here to open the knuckle. Before coupling cars, always check the knuckles are open, or you'll just bounce right off. Okay. The junction is correctly aligned and the cars are ready to couple. They couple up to the cars by gently driving into them at a slow speed. And most freight uses automatic knuckle couplers, so they will automatically couple once they connect. If your speed is too high, you risk derailing when coupling. Apply some brakes to slow your approach. Hey, nice work! Now change direction with the reverser and move the train forward into the indicated siding. Remember to apply a little power before releasing brakes while it's not strictly necessary in the training center, this is the time to start forming great habits. Since you have freight cars coupled, you should slow down using the automatic brake and get the extra braking effort from those freight cars. The automatic brake applies brakes throughout the entire train.
uncouple the cars either by using the external camera or by walking to the cars on foot. That's it for this training module. Okay, in this training module, you'll be learning how to perform a hill start and practice the switch from throttle to braking as you crest a gradient and go from ascending to descending. You'll be using GE ES44 C4 locomotives hauling heavy intermodal freight. Now you'll go through the steps needed to take over this locomotive. Getting moving, it's worth remembering the following sequence that was covered in the locomotive training modules. Independent on, auto off. Throttle on, independent off. Let's go through that slowly and understand why. If you apply power too quickly, the wheels will slip. If this happens, reduce the amount of power to regain control and then gently reapply. If you are struggling for grip, apply sand to increase traction. That's it. You're moving forwards under power. If you use the same start process every time you begin moving, it'll become second nature. Congratulations, you have reached the summit. As you start your descent, you'll need to switch to dynamic brakes to control your speed. 
The most effective speed for dynamic brakes is around 30 miles per hour. So if you're exceeding that speed, you should be slowing down. Above 30 miles per hour, the dynamic brakes become a lot less effective, and you will be more reliant on the automatic brake. The automatic brake on its own will not provide enough fine control of the speed of the train. It's a blunt instrument, because you can't partially release the brakes, and they take a few minutes to apply to the setting you've asked for. If you try to rely on just the automatic brake, you will often find yourself coming to a halt or going over speed while you wait anxiously for the brakes to apply. Uh, watch the train speed as it crests the top of the gradient. You'll go from needing power to maintain speed to finding that power starting to accelerate the train. When you see that, start backing off power and aim to keep your speed below 30 miles per hour. Now, once your throttle is at zero and you're starting to pick up speed a little, it's time to get the dynamic brakes into their setup position. They'll need to be there for 10 seconds before you can use them further. They start adding dynamic brake as needed to keep the speed in check. The dynamic brake is only on the locomotive, and will react nearly instantly. As you begin to get to larger amounts of dynamic brake needing to be applied, <laughs> it's time to bring in the automatic brake to help. In most cases, a minimum set of automatic brake is enough. Apply that now. Uh -huh. Watch out that on some locomotives, as you apply the automatic brake, uh, this will cut the dynamic brake out entirely. Uh, this is because of the brakes applying on your locomotive. If you notice this happening, pull the independent brake towards you into the bail off position, and it will release those brakes only, leaving the automatic brake on the rest of the train. Uh, and you will see the dynamic brake come back into action immediately. As the automatic brake begins to take effect down the length of the train, you'll notice the train begin to slow down due to the extra braking effort. Now gently dial back the amount of dynamic brake to compensate for this, and continue to try and aim to keep your speed around, but not exceeding, 30 miles per hour. If you find that full dynamic brake is unable to hold the train speed, Add a little air with the automatic brake. Wait to see how the train reacts, and adjust with the dynamics as needed. Always work under your target speed of 30 miles per hour. If you find yourself chasing faster speeds, you'll need to take more substantial corrective action with the automatic brake. Okay, come to a stop up ahead using the automatic brake.
Right. Well, that concludes this training module. It is highly recommended that you practice both hill starting and the change from ascent to descent until you are comfortable with them. They are one of the more challenging aspects of operating heavy freight, and you'll really feel like you're in more control of this train as you get the hang of this task. All right, in this training module, you'll be learning about the different brake types found in a typical U.S. freight locomotive. Take a seat in the engineer's position. Now you'll go through the steps needed to take over this locomotive. Uh -huh. now this locomotive has three types of brakes. Independent, automatic, and dynamic. Now the operation of them can be counterintuitive until you get the hang of how they work. The independent brake applies brakes on just the locomotives and should be used when running a light loco or performing hill starts. They respond very quickly, but won't be of great use when you've got a long, heavy train behind you. The automatic brake applies brakes on the entire formation and should be used when bringing a consist to a stop, assisting the dynamic brakes on steep descents, or otherwise making more substantial speed decreases. These brakes are slow to respond, and you can't partially release them. So if you want a bit less braking, you have to release them entirely, wait for the system to repressurize, and then you can reapply. The dynamic brake uses the locomotive's traction motors to slow the train down. These can be very effective at controlling your speed on descents and are mostly effective between around 10 and 30 miles per hour. Either side of that, you're going to need one of the other brake systems. There are several gauges used to describe what is happening in the brake system of this locomotive, and they're common to a wide range of locomotives. Uh, the brake cylinder, or BC gauge, tells you the amount of pressure going directly onto the wheels. Now, this is ultimately how much braking effort is stopping your train. If it's zero, the train is not applying any brakes. The independent brake lever directly controls this, but be aware that this is only reporting the state of the brake cylinder on your own locomotive, and not the rest of the train. Apply the independent brake now to full, and notice that the BC gauge rapidly changes to reflect that. The brake pipe, or BP gauge, tells you the amount of pressure on the brake pipe that extends the length of the entire train. On U.S. freight, this is pressurized to 90 psi as normal. The brake pipe serves two functions. One is to provide air to all the freight cars down the length of the train so they can charge their own reservoirs. The other is that its pressure controls what the other vehicles do with their brakes. At 90 psi, the brakes on all vehicles will be released. As the brake pressure in the brake pipe drops below 90 psi, the other vehicles will apply brakes. Depending on the length of your train, Changing the pressure on the brake pipe can be quite time-consuming, whether charging it up to release the brakes or reducing the pressure to apply them. And this is the reason that automatic brakes are tricky to use. The brake pipe works in conjunction with another system called the equalizing reservoir. 
Because charging the brake pipe is time-consuming, and you don't want to be watching that to find the right pressure, the equalizing reservoir is a much faster responding gauge, and is what you primarily use to control the brake pipe. The automatic brake handle controls the equalizing reservoir. Apply the brakes a little with a lever, it will cause the equalizing reservoir to lower in pressure rapidly to the desired level. Uh, this causes the brake pipe to begin slowly changing to match the equalizing reservoir, and it'll automatically stop once it is done so. Release the automatic brake, and you will see the equalizing reservoir rapidly rise back to 90 PSI. At this point, the final reservoir will come into action, the main reservoir, shown as MR on the HUD. This is a high-pressure reservoir, which is used to feed air pressure back into the brake pipe to make it go up again. You'll see the brake pipe begin to climb, the main reservoir begin to drop, and periodically the compressor will start up to put more air back into the main reservoir until the brake pipe finally matches the equalizing reservoir again. Now there are some key behaviors of this system to remember. The longer the formation, the slower the brake pipe will be to respond. You cannot partially release automatic brakes. If you are braking too much, you may need to fully release the brakes, allow the brake pipe to get back to 90 PSI again, and then you can reapply them. This should be carefully considered, however, as you will have no air brakes during this time. Uh, bring the train to a stop in the indicated position using the automatic brake.
Well, that concludes this training module. It's covered a lot of theory, but understanding the way these brakes work will help you understand why your train reacts the way it does. These freight trains are nothing like modern passenger trains with fast acting and fully controllable brakes, but equally, they must manage massive, long, and heavy trains on steep gradients, an entirely different kind of challenge. Uh, run this module again in the training center and repeat it any time you need a refresher.